Welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to see so many people. Um, I'm Dr. Susan Watkins. I'm director of the Centre for Culture and the Arts at Leeds Beckett University. I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth in our series of Leeds Cultural Conversations. The Centre has organised this series in partnership with Leeds City Council and it's also supported by the publisher Palgrave Macmillan. We're working closely with Palgrave on their campaign for the humanities. For more information about the other forthcoming talks in the series, there are flyers on your chairs or please visit our website. Just to let you know that the talks are being filmed and there will be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So today I'm delighted to introduce Dr Shane Ewan. Shane is Senior Lecturer in Urban History at Leeds Beckett University. He leads the Centre's research strand on cultures of environment, space and place. Shane is a specialist in 19th and 20th century urban space, environmental crisis, disasters and municipal government. Shane's first book was Fighting Fires, Creating the British Fire Service, 1800 to 1978. And he's also the co-editor of Another Global History, Historical Explorations into the Transnational Municipal Moment, 1850 to 2000. So today we're celebrating the launch of Shane's latest book, What is Urban History, <laughs> which has just been published by Polity Press. It takes a global and comparative approach to urban history and covers multiple cities across the world, including London, Paris, New York, Chicago, Mumbai, Rio de Janeiro, Mexican City and Shanghai, amongst others. There are discounted flyers available on the table outside if you would like to order a copy. So, today Shane will be talking to us on the subject of doing urban history in an urban world and he'll be introducing some of the ways that we can research the history of Leeds as urban historians. Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Um, it's a real honour to be in the Albert Room um, this lunchtime um, and to talk to you in the Town Hall. Anyway, that's, you know, that's for sure. Uh, what I would say up front is that Leeds is also in this book as well. And to my students sitting in the audience who might work with me at third year or MA level, you will be using this book. Um, it is, as you can see, slim enough to fit, in, fit into a, a Christmas stocking. Um, so far in this series of cultural conversations, we've had talks on the Capital of Culture bid, West Indian Carnival, and the financial crisis of 2008. All of these talks have been linked by cities, not just by the fact that events have taken place in cities, but that the cities themselves have acted as an agent in their own making. Urban historians like myself approach the city as something that should be more than the sum of its component parts. Although these parts, as we'll see today, are themselves important spaces of historical scrutiny. I've always wanted to share a forum with the great French historian Fernand Braudel, and now is my moment. Braudel famously wrote, every town is and wishes to be a separate world. But we must also recognise that the modern city is part of a wider regional, national, international and even transnational network of cities. Cities are linked by trade, by people, by goods, by culture, by ideologies and such like. The city is both a product of the increasingly global flows in the world, but crucially also helps to shape and structure those flows. I want to use the talk today to explore some of the rich pickings that are available to urban historians when studying the city. As Sue says, um, a lot of the themes and issues are elaborated upon in, 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 this, in this very short book. Um, I want to talk about some examples, um, and the examples that I'm going to talk about are not in this book. They are about Leeds, and they're examples related to my current research project and some of the work that I've done in the past. So you've got some surprises coming. But first, I think we need to define our our, our field of inquiry. So what is urban history? Well, it's concerned with the, with the history of, the ta of towns and cities over time. What I call in this book 
the place in context approach. It's also the study of the history of urban processes, stuff like urbanisation, municipalisation, industrialisation, and so on and so forth. My students have heard me talk about this stuff before. Um, so its focus is on the relationship between those who live and work in urban settlements and the wider social, economic, political, cultural processes that give our lives and our places shape and definition. Urban history is concerned with architecture, engineering, space, people, place, social groups, processes, materiality, anything, frankly, that is in built into the environment, the urban environment. Echoing Jenny Robinson's argument that cities exist in a world of cities and thus routinely invite a comparative gesture. There is something innately comparative about urban history because of its place in context, you know, its, its case study approach. We approach the city in its totality. It's what makes us different to social historians. Um, we're interested in producing whole histories of the ways that a city has been planned, designed, built, inhabited, appropriated, celebrated, despoiled, destroyed, and we're thinking about the images over the weekend in the lakes, and discarded. The urban historian considers the factors that establish the city as an object for historical study. So urban history has its origins, its thematic origins and its geographical origins in the Western world. Um, beginning at the turn of the 20th century, really as we understand it um, today, in a national context. Um, and its borders have grown over the, the last century or more into a global and a transnational phenomenon by the beginning of the 21st century. But I argue in this book that interest in urban history as a form of scholarship inevitably began in the Western world and was always outward facing. Um, historians have always researched their cities like Leeds in relation to external points of reference other cities in the region, in the nation, or overseas. But there has been a shift in the last generation, the last 20 to 30 years, towards cross-national case studies, cross-national comparisons. And I think of someone like Harold Platt's comparison of Manchester and Chicago here. Uh, and, and the reasons for this are, are fairly straightforward. Um, urban historians are interested in common urban typologies. Global cities, capital cities, second cities, you know, industrial manufacturing cities like, like Leeds, um, port cities, county towns, seaside resorts, and the like. Um, we're also joined across the world through our thematic approach, and these are the themes that's, that form the basis of the chapters um, in, in what is urban history. So this sort of comparative exercise is hardly surprising for those scholars who want to understand the shared experiences of an urban way of life, as the great Chicago um, geographer Lewis Worth um, called it. So whilst interest in the history of towns and cities is as old as the process of urbanisation itself, the evolution of urban history coincided with the spread of industrial urbanisation across the Western world, as captured wonderfully in Pugin's depiction of an industrial town here that my students have been um, seeing this term. Much of the early interest, the sort of 18th and 19th century interest in towns and cities came from fields that were not traditionally considered part of the mainstream of history. So things like um, antiquarianism, civic, municipal biography, local history. And I think this interest in the left field um, established a crucial precedent in the field, which continues today. Um, urban historians and their interests are stimulated by what's going on in the world today as we speak, contemporary problems and anxieties, as well as the drive to initiate a more systematic and planned society. We're mostly, but not exclusively, left-wing. Um, as the urban scholar Lewis Mumford famously wrote, the new industrial city of the 19th century had many lessons to teach 
but for the urbanist writing in the, 20, you know, in the mid 20th century, its chief lesson was in what to avoid. And it's no coincidence that historical interest in, uh, in the urban condition mirrored a simultaneous interest in town planning at the turn of the 20th century, the Garden Cities movement, in municipalization, in charity, philanthropy. What's clear is that the age of the Western metropolis had arrived by the 20th century. London had displaced Beijing and Constantinople as the largest city in the world. Six and a half million residents, turn of the 20th century. Second place, New York, just over four million. Paris in third, followed by Berlin and Chicago. 16 cities in total had populations of more than one million at the turn of the century, and the list was largely dominated by European and American cities. Now, this attracted enormous interest from contemporary writers working in Chicago, working in Germany, Max Weber that springs to mind, um, or um, people like Simmel, George Simmel and, and Walter Benjamin, who were interested in the ways that urbanisation was being intellectually and culturally perceived. Um, so there was an interest in the metropolis as a, as, a, as a mental transformation in urban culture, a new way of life, as much as it was a sort of demographic and economic phenomenon that could be mapped. And those ideas, those models, especially the work of Max Weber, um, went on to shape urban historiography for the next 50 years. Um, Weber's work in particular has really you know, been very influential over, over myself um, and other historians of, of modern Leeds like Bob Morris. Um, you know, Weber said every modern city basically has a fort. And what is a Leeds town hall if it's not a modern variation of the fort? Um, a market, and I'm thinking here in terms of Broderick's Corn Exchange or the Kirkgate Market, um, a court and some kind of associative culture conjoined around property ownership, you know, the sort of nascent middle class. The second half of the 20th century, however, saw an important shift. Um, and it, there was an explosion in urban populations across the developing world. The fastest growth took place in Africa, Latin America, the Indian subcontinent, the Middle East, and China. This produced the modern phenomenon of the megacity. A megacity being a city with a population of more than 10 million inhabitants. So dwarfing our turn of the 20th century comparisons. In 2011, there were nearly 500 cities or urban agglomerations with populations exceeding 1 million. There were 26 of these that were megacities. Tokyo is now the largest city in the world with an agglomeration of 38 million, followed by Delhi with 25 million, Shanghai, 23, and then Mexico City, Mumbai, and Sao Paulo, with each with around 21 million inhabitants. By 2030, the United Nations estimates that there will be 41 megacities in the world, the vast majority of which will be found in developing countries. Cities have even started to merge together to create new spatial configurations. Um, we have mega regions of large cities, Bangalore, Mexico City, Cairo. These have amalgamated neighboring towns and cities within their economic orbit. Urban corridors, these link two or more large cities, sometimes even across national borders. For example, Mumbai, Delhi, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and even state-sponsored city regions in China, like the Pearl River Delta. Um, the Pearl River Delta includes nine large cities with an aggregate surface area 26 times that of Greater London. So we're thinking in terms of large scale here. And so these important shifts in the last generation or more have also attracted enormous interest in urban histories or past histories of the urban world. And there have been particular interest in um, cities in the developing world and the ways in which they come into contact with the Western metropolis. So, for example, the, the history of um, the, the treaty port cities in China, places like Tianjin and Shanghai. So, urban history as a, as a field of research 
is tied in with this meta-narrative of urbanisation, which poses opportunities and challenges to us as historians of local communities, our local towns and cities, Leeds in this case. Because as individual researchers, it's really hard, it's really challenging, it's really um, time expensive and financially expensive to conduct cross-national, transnational, international case studies. Um, but what urban history has handed down to us are the sorts of tools and concepts by which we can conduct local case studies. Um, in particular, and what I want to talk about for the rest of, the, rest of the, um, this lunchtime, is the idea of the urban spatial form. Um, because every city has shared urban spatial forms. A city centre or a downtown, um, streets, squares, slums, suburbs, um, etc. Um, so as long as we're alive to the connections that link them across our global world, um, we can look at things like streets as, the, as a way in which they represent cities in microcosm. You know, streets and squares symbolise the ways that cities are designed and built and lived and ruined and discarded, as we'll see from my examples, according to changing taste and style and so on. So, interest in urban spatial forms originated in the early 1960s through path-breaking work by Jane Jacobs, um, Kevin Lynch, Lewis Mumford, Jean Gottman, and others. They're writing at a time of perceived urban crisis in town planning in the US and, and the Western world at large. They argued for greater attention on the ways that urban populations were interacting with their cities, especially as they're being redesigned by jet-setting urban planners according to the principles of international modernism. So they argue that the planners themselves are ignoring the everyday interactions of people with cities, and not as interested in people. Um, and instead, they all argue and stress the importance of drilling down into their respective cities. You know, and their main lesson for the planners is we need to consult with local communities if we're going to redesign and recreate, reconfigure streets. Now, so this is a contemporary scholarship and it's, it's accompanied by historical scholarship. H.J. Dios is writing about Camberwell in South London in the early 1960s. Sam Bass Warner is writing about streetcar suburbs in Boston, Massachusetts. So in the suburb as a distinctive spatial form is being historicised. And together, these pioneering texts um, have gone on to shape the field. So let's look at the street. Jane Jacobs is important here. Jacobs criticised post-war urban policy. She criticised modernist planners, architects and engineers for destroying traditional urban communities. She cited the destruction of the street and the sidewalk. She described the sidewalk as the nervous system of the city. You know, you know, their destruction in, in favour of high-rise apartment blocks um, and um, interstate freeways and highways, the kind of unfettered embrace of the motor car. Heralded the death of downtown in US cities. Detroit's a great example of that. So the modern city plan, she says, has this bird's eye view of the city. And they see the city as a conduit to aid the circulation of goods, money, people, rather than as a place for community relationships, social interactions. You know, and of course these planners are influenced by the pioneering work of architects and planners like Le Corbusier in the 1930s, Frank Lloyd Wright um, as well. And this process is, is as discernible in cities in the developing world, like Kuala Lumpur, Mexico City, as it is in western cities like Los Angeles, Freeway City, Bradford and Leeds. And some of you in the audience may remember the city council's decision in the 1970s to rebrand Leeds as Motorway City. And those of us who work around Broadcasting Place and Woodhouse Lane will recognise that. Yet this bird's eye view of the street, Jacobs reminds us, did not take into account the lived reality of the street. 
With each redevelopment, the planner is turning his back on the street for the block. You know, the block is easier to plan, easier to control and police. You know, whereas, as you can see from the quote here, Jacob says, people who actually use cities, downtown, know very well that we need not fewer streets, but more of them, especially for pedestrians. And I can only echo this as a runner, we are always making our own paths through cities and spaces, taking shortcuts more often than not, as you know. Um, the street is, is, is important. It plays an important role as an actor in our urban histories. So, taking my cue from Jacobs, I would argue that the street is a great site where you can tr examine an urban way of life. You can trace it through the variety of social groups that interact with it, and also those who are hired to police it, to control it, to regulate the street. The street clearly means different things to different people, is what I'm saying. And you didn't think you'd come to a lecture from me and not hear about the fire service. Um, the current, the, my current research about Leeds Fire Brigade at the turn of the 20th century, the history and the heritage of the brigade, has revealed the importance of the street to firefighter culture, to the professionalisation of the fire service. And if you think about it, fire brigades rely on speed, on movement, on responsiveness to, to respond to emergencies. So the street is integral to this. It's integral to their professionalisation, to their ability to function. And you can see it, so that, so that sadly, no longer with us, but the, the original central fire station from Leeds, which, for those who don't know, was right around the corner on Park Street, where the combined courts are today. Put up in 1883, uh, with subsequent amendments at the turn of the century. This is an OS map that shows you the station quite clearly on Park Street, this turn of the 20th century. And the firefighters lived in these streets around the area. Um, Oxford Row, Chariot Street, Leighton Place, Park Street. So this was a little firefighters community from the turn of the century, really up until the 1970s. We can see how the building was designed to give firefighters quick and easy access to the street. You can see all these mod cons, sliding poles, to get you out of, the, out of the station, down onto the fire ground as quickly as possible. You know, the kind of iron, the, the, the balconies and the iron railings, the drill tower, where they could practice hook ladder drill, you know, hone their skills in order to save lives quicker. Um, the, 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 the firemen slept in sort of dormitory style barracks because um, at this time firemen worked a continuous duty system. They always had to be on duty um, for an emergency. Um, so that there's a fusion of machines, technology and manual power designed to give them greater and quicker access to the street. And these ideas came from trips that the fire officers and the city council made to other British cities, to cities on the continent, um, to American ideas. Leeds has always been well plugged into international municipal networks. So newspapers like the Leeds Mercury and the Yorkshire Post talked about the Americanisation of the fire service at the turn of the 20th century, um, when they get their first chemical fire fire engine in 1901. There's huge disappointment because they go to a house fire in Horsforth and it's already been put out. So, you know, they don't get to, they don't get to trial it so soon. Um, a decade before, in 1891, French firemen, uh, the Sapper Pompier, they visit, they visit the UK and they visit Leeds. Um, when they arrive, they wander from the train station up to the town hall and they're greeted by the Union Jack flanked by two of the French tricolor outside. You know, great early example of Anglo-French friendship. I want to show a brief film clip, if I may, um, illustrating the importance of the street 
to the Leeds Fire Brigade. So this is a short film clip taken from the famous Mitchell and Kenyon collection, these Blackburn filmmakers uh, across the Pennines in Lancashire. Um, oh, I'll get this right. So this is turn of the century, 1901. It's one of the earliest films of fire, of fire services in the whole world. It's silent, obviously. Well, I say it's silent, but as you're watching it, Imagine the noise, the cacophony of noise. Here they are galloping down the street, down Park Street. You can almost hear the, the, the thundering of the horses' hooves. What year is this? 1901. clanging of the, of the bell, the kids shouting and screaming with excitement. Plain chicken, yeah, an early form of chicken, if you like. I don't yet know if these are the children of the firefighters themselves. Um, some of them undoubtedly will be. It's a brilliant example of a, of a, of a Mitchell and Kenyon film. These were sold to locals as lo local films for local people. They were exhibited on the same day that they were filmed. I know it reminds us of the League of Gentlemen. Uh, and so the kids, once the engines have gone, the kids all turn on the camera. They're fascinated by the, the new technology of filmmaking. And here, you know, here are my heroes, um, the Leeds firemen. So I'm going to cut them off. So I hope the film expresses some of the points I'm making. The street is a space of danger, excitement, fear, control, speed, noise, modernity. Um, Leeds isn't alone here, of course. This is for Matthew G. Gavertov's wonderful film, Man with a Movie Camera, um, you know, named in this, as one of the ten best films of all time by Sight and Sound magazine. That has a wonderful scene of a fire engine racing around the streets of Moscow in the 1930s, chase, you know, chasing the fire, clanging the bell. You know, this, is, this, is, this is modernity in, in Eastern Europe as well as Western Europe. Speed of turnout was, of course, wasted energy if the streets were blocked, if they were congested, if they couldn't get through. So fire engine manufacturers invented new methods of communicating with the public. Clanging bells, later flashing lights and sirens as we recognise them today. This didn't please everybody. One chap wrote into the Evening Post to complain about the new oral disturbance of these fire engines on the street, crowds being scattered far and wide by these new American machines. Fire engines were becoming bigger, bolder, faster and louder, and the street was being reconfigured which doesn't suit everybody's tastes. Jump forward about 60 years to a time when the street and emergency services are again being reconfigured around speed and technology, but especially, I guess, around the motor car. So in 1964, the City Council decides to shift Brigade Headquarters from Park Street to Kirkstall Road. And you can see the product of this decision here. Fortunately, this building is no longer there, um, but it is a great example of modernist architecture. Completed in 1972, shortly before the Leeds Fire Brigade was disbanded and transferred to West Yorkshire Fire Service under local government reorganisation. The decision to shift the, the, the station was because Park Street was seen as unfit for a modern fire service, especially one that had to deal with road traffic accidents you know, and stuff like that. Um, first response medical support. Park Street was too small, too crowded, too cramped. The streets, the cobbled streets, were too, were, were, you know, slowed down these modern motorised fire engines, you know. And everything that the city's authorities had tried in terms of hiring parking wardens, trialling one-way systems, no parking zones, stuff like that, to, to free Park Street had failed. The motor car was taking over Leeds and there was nothing that the fire brigade could do about it. So they moved. 
And he moved to Kirkstall Road so that they could, they could have better access to the road. So, you know, as you can see from the quotation there. So the street is being reconfigured again by planners, by city councillors, with an emphasis on public safety and control. Public safety is being designed into the city. Park Street Fire Station, no longer with us, it's now the combined courts. And the only visible reminders that the fire brigade were once you know, ubiquitous to the area are a couple of houses on Great George Street and Park Street that are still there, and the George Inn, which was frequented by firemen in the 1950s and 1960s before the fire brigade installed its own bar in Park Street Station so they could keep an eye on their men. Just before I talk about my second case study, here's a question. What do these cities have in common? Yes, and my wife can keep quiet. <laughs> Twin, cities. Twin cities, thank you very much. Yes, these are all cities that are twinned with Leeds. Um, the earliest, Siegen, in, in, in northern Germany was, was originally a twin of Morley. Um, but when Morley became part of Leeds City Council's boundaries following reorganisation, Leeds inherited it. So technically Leeds' oldest twin is, is, is Lille in, in the north of France. Um, these cities, Leeds has various kind of informal links with or there have been discussions over past years to, to, to sign formal twinning agreements, but for whatever reason, it hasn't, it hasn't happened. Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia. Um, Leeds, Alabama. Well, given Leeds is a suburb of Birmingham, Alabama, that obviously never had any mileage. Um, I, won't, I won't read through them all. You can ask about them if you want at the end. For those who don't know, Twinning is a formal agreement signed between, normally between two cities, um, committing themselves to closer ties, um, educational, social, cultural, economic ties. Um, it was very popular in the 1950s and 1960s as a form of rapprochement between West German and French towns and cities following you know, following the war, and British cities got interested in the 60s and the 70s as a precursor to the country becoming a formal member of the economic community in, in, in the 70s. So our second urban spatial form is the public square, Dortmund Square. Um, we know it, it's, 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 again, it's only around the corner, literally, by the St John's Centre. Um, the photograph is from 1980, and St John's has, has not yet been put up. The square was opened in 1980 to celebrate 10 years of twinning between Law Leeds and Dortmund, um, and is, I guess, most recognisable for us by the statue um, of the Dortmund Drayman, a.k.a. the fat man with the barrel. Uh, <laughs> the statue symbolises the two cities economic connections over beer and the brewing industries, you know, both being long established centres. Of course, Dortmund and Leeds are also both historical coal mining centres, so there were important economic connections between the two cities. This shared love of beer is also captured in this beautiful photograph from the Leodis website of the respective mayors at the 10th anniversary dinner in Lewis's department store on the head row. And the Leeds mayor, the chap on the left, is clearly a true Yorkshireman, judging by this photograph. Now, the photograph itself captures some of the tensions within twinning. It's, not, it's a controversial movement. You know, many popular images, media images, have tended to focus on the beer-swilling jollies of, of, of municipal officials at taxpayers' expense. So some true, these are, these are real, genuine trips that have been made in the last 10 to 15 years. Council trips to, to German beer festivals. 
hot air balloon rides across French valleys, rock and roll pilgrimages to Memphis. Where do I sign up? Um, the elected mayor of Doncaster even de-twinned all of his town cities when he was elected on the grounds that it was a waste of money. Um, in 2002, the Somerset town of Wincanton twinned with the fictional disc world town of Ankh-Morpork. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea, that really. But, um, but I think the criticism is unfair. I think the criticism masks important political, social and cultural advantages that have been accrued from twinning. And I think twinning um, has some genuine lessons for contemporary politicians and policy makers. And I think we're seeing some of this playing out at the moment as part of the cultural, the capital of culture bid um, that Leeds is putting together for 2023. The practice of twinning, as, it, as, as Antoine Vion describes it, was the first step taken by municipalities to define their interests on the international stage after the Second World War. My own research has shown how this has extended and expanded on earlier pre-war municipal international networks. So, for example, Leeds' early connections with Lille and <coughs> Dortmund have their origins in early agreements between the universities and between civic associations within the town, youth exchanges between Leeds and Dortmund in the late 50s. So twinning itself as a form of what I've called civic marriage follows on and builds on those earlier incremental ad hoc relationships. And as I've said, you know, twinning, you know, it's a form of reconciliation and rapprochement in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, but later still, our bilateral links between two cities become multilateral. More and more, more, and more cities marry, you know, join the fold. And, and they do so for different reasons. The most famous one I can think of is between Birmingham, Lyon, Frankfurt and Milan. All former second industrial cities with that shared post-industrial heritage. And they got together to exchange young workers in the 1970s and 1980s who were struggling, you know, struggling to find work because of um, structural unemployment. And they subsequently became central players in the EU-funded Eurocities network in the 1990s to lobby the EU for financial resources to help regenerate their city centres. And I think you know, there's similar motives behind the Dortmund, Leeds and Lille triangle certainly in the 1980s. And so there's a, you know, the British context clearly associates twinning in terms of civic and educational exchange, school trips. And some of us in this room today have done that. You know, global citizenship, to use the popular term at the moment. New relationships involving British local authorities doubled from 180 from 184 in the 60s to 365 in the 70s. And of that 365, over 200 were between French and British towns and, a, and 101 between British and German. So there's a clear, or West German, I should say. So there's a clear Western European influence over early twinning in the UK. In the 80s, as, you can, you know, as we saw from this data, we expand a little you know, a bit. So there's, you know, new areas of the world. China. Um, twinning in China is driven by economic resources and you know, the drive for new markets. Um, Eastern Europe, certainly as the Cold War comes to an end, this is about tr the transition towards democracy in a, in a, in a, in a post-communist Eastern Europe through the case of, of, of Brno in the Czech Republic. Um, and then more recently still, you've got the expansion into, into Africa with the Durban connection. And more recently still, Louisville. Um, the Americans call twinning sister cities. They like to be different. Um, so in the case of the Leeds Dortmund twinning, signed in 1970, we see both this kind of rapprochement 
You know, this spirit of mutual understanding and cooperation that is there um, throughout the 50s and the 60s, but also something tan something that's, 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 that's different, something that's, that emphasizes social, intellectual, cultural, and economic intercourse. You know, this is two cities keen to stress the benefits of their marriage to their citizens, their taxpayers. Um, hence the celebrations in 1980 to mark the decade with, the, you know, the creation of Dortmund Square. Ten years later, in 1990, Dortmund Fest was held um, with an eclectic but more popular list of activities. Jazz music and street theatre on Dortmund Square. The Leeds Challenge Cycling Cup. A Dortmund-inspired parade through the city led by an Oompa band. And the now obligatory beer fest. There is nothing Dortmund about our current beer festival, our Christmas market, I, I want to stress that. So Dortmund Square symbolises the rich history and the legacy of twinning for global second cities like Leeds. It illustrates the networks that connect second cities as nodes in the wider flows of social, cultural and political capital. It reminds us that it's not just capital cities and nation states driving globalisation and, and, and cross-national networks. I'm concluding, you'll be pleased to, to know. I've got two points I want to make, two broad points. So these two case studies, what did they tell us about doing an urban history of Leeds in the 20th century? Firstly, the urban historian cannot separate the city from its wider, the wider urban world that it inhabits. Um, it's not enough to simply explain local changes, what's happening on a, on a street by street <coughs> basis. We need to understand why these things happen and what their wider significance is. Comparison between places is one way to do this. You know, and in the case of twinning, the comparison is there through the decision between these cities to marry. Dortmund and Leeds make good comparators. In the case of Park Street, we can see through the story the rise and fall of Park Street as the professionalisation of the fire service, the spread of modernist architecture, the rise of the motor car. These are our big so what processes that are acting on and being influenced by the urban spaces and the people who inhabit them. Secondly, over time, cities are rebuilt, redeveloped, reconfigured, reimagined according to changing tastes and practices. The city then is a text to be read by planners, geographers, historians, people. Um, it is also a place to interact with, to experience. Um, Mark Steinberg has written how walking across a city is like walking through time and space. You know, it's condensing history into a fragment of time. So, in the making of the English landscape, W.G. Hoskins urged his readers to walk the fields, to cycle the country lanes, in order to better understand the countryside in the 1950s and 1960s, as we were seeing some of the major changes that I talked about at the beginning. The same principle surely extend to the city. So lace up your walking boots and get out and wander around the concrete jungle. Don't forget to look up. Don't forget to look down. Or you might miss some quite beautiful, small, banal, everyday examples of urban architecture, such as this manhole cover in Berlin, Alexanderplatz. This is a map of Berlin. So in an urban world where more and more people live in cities, depend on cities, where cities remain the economic and cultural engines, the powerhouse, if you like, we need more, not fewer, urban histories. We need a greater historic understanding of the evolution of urban spaces and communities. Thank you for listening. Right. Um, has anyone got any questions? 
Matthew, would you like to start? Okay, thank you very much for that. I was still thinking for more about toilets and the sewer system, but I'll be satisfied with just one ramble. Flying uh, scuds. Couldn't find the references, but uh, I, I, I just want to start, ask about four contemporary developments with cities around the world, and ask whether they are changing the paradigms or perspectives of the urban history. Right? The first is the slum. Okay, so we can have a reformist perspective where slums are in the past and everyone's moving into nice new houses and there's proper sewerage, but the majority experience of new people going to urban settings is they're moving into slums. Yeah. And in some ways, the slums are, are better than what they lived in before. I mean, uh -huh. the planners in Beijing and Mumbai come along with their bulldozers to clear them out of the way, uh -huh. out on the side of the, of the, of the slum world. So, does the rise, the new rise of the slum, challenge your perspectives? Secondly, the neoliberal city, the uh, the commodification of what have been the commons, all those sorts of things, and analysis. If you take back to Mike Davis, the rise of the malls as a kind of con con control of space, which actually takes attention away from the uh, away away from the. Uh, streets and is probably responsible for there being fewer public toilets than there <laughs> you, you, you used to be. Thirdly, a change in spatial relations which actually challenged the notion of the city, the rise of what's called the H city, which is yeah. it's like there is no, well, it's nowhere, there, where is the city? It's on the H, it's just a whole series of linkages between mm -hmm. different, different places. Mm -hmm. you know? So, mm -hmm. is that altering the your view of the city and, and, and finally the aim of the city. You know, it's not just my civilization where we see cities disappearing. Yeah. Detroit. Yeah, yeah. They turn the large parts of Detroit to yeah. the prairies. Yeah. You know, so these are four things happening in the world of cities now. Yeah. Are they changing your view as a urban uh, historian? Yeah. Well, they, well, I suppose, yeah, yeah, there's another book in that, isn't there? Matt? Thanks, Matthew. Um, there's a, well, there's a huge amount I could potentially say about that. I mean, the slum is, a, the slum is fascinating because what you've got in the cities that you cited, or somewhere like Rio de Janeiro, you're right, the, the slums are, are, are better than the alternative, better than what the council is offering them or the, or the private developers. And when the bulldozers come in, the, you know, yes, the communities are preventing them from, from, from kicking them out. And it's often, it's the, it's, it's the women with their children who are, who are you know, blocking the way of the, of the bulldozers. The big change, I suppose, certainly in the developing world, is that the slums are becoming, are, are, like our edge cities, are moving further and further away from the centre. So whereas we have that kind of historical um, picture of the slum in the, in the western city, it's something that's central. It's, it, as the Chicago School of Geography mapped out in the 1920s. Um, it's oh, around, yeah. it's the inner city. Sorry? Banlieu. Yeah, yeah, oh yes, yeah, yeah. Well, the Banlieu is a more, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a modern kind of extension of that. Um, but yeah, but there is this, certainly in, in, in the Indian subcontinent or in Latin American cities, there's a huge shift away. So the commuters are the poorest people, the poorest urban dwellers. And I think that, I mean, that's kind of harking back to the pre-industrial urban model, when the poor lived on the edges and the rich lived in the, in the, in the, in the centre, as we get in Paris and the French cities. So are we seeing a shift in our spatial understanding of the city back to something that's pre-industrial? Now we are living in a post-industrial society. Maybe. You know, I don't know. Maybe. Yes, you can always find mm. cases that support that, but also cases that possibly challenge it. Um, the edge city, yeah, that's fascinating. Edge lands. Uh, and there's a huge amount of interest in it, isn't there? You know, and, you know, and I think of Joel Garrio's famous work from the early 1990s. I don't know how does. Well, I get yeah. So it's related to my, my first point. You know, so there's a. So whereas once upon a time in the industrial city, the main manufacturing space is in the centre, now it's being moved out to business parks. Um, you know, places like that outside the city. But that is always, what's driving all of this is always the cost of land. That's central to it, isn't it? And the, and the, and the tenure system. Um, you know, land costs less the further out you get. So for a business, I guess it makes more sense these days to invest, keeps the overheads down. Um, is it transforming the city? Yeah, I, I, I suppose it is. Um, the neoliberal city, I don't know. <laughs> You're the expert. <laughs> 
I'm not sure. What do you think? I'm turning it back on you. You asked me four questions. <laughs> Perhaps we should give um, someone else a chance to ask someone else. That's it. Like well, the thing, to... Detroit, there is a huge local community mobilisation to, you know, um, to, to, to salvage something from that, from that death. So I don't think Detroit is, is not dead. There is hope yet. Yes. Yeah. With, you say, it's more and more of the world is becoming urban. I was travelling around and it's places like Amsterdam and Venice they've been built in such precarious places. Yeah. Like Venice yeah. is sinking and Amsterdam needs sort of loads of flood defences to just keep it existing. Yeah. So is that sort of that sort of trait of humans to build places mm. where it will look pretty but not necessarily be there for mm. forever? Is that like a Western thing because it's sort of gone when the Eastern ones have sprung up or do they build them? Not necessarily, yeah. Too? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the vast majority of cities that are, yeah, that suffer from destruction are, are rebuilt. You know, certainly outside of the you know our period of antiquity, um, you know modern cities we we see through war, for example, through natural disaster, including in the developing world. So a city like Manila, in the Philippines, which has suffered uh, suffers an, a, an awful problem with fire, um, gets rebuilt time and time again. Tokyo, you know the great earthquake in the 1920s, it's rebuilt. That what what set, what differentiates us is is the way is our mentality. And our obsession in the West with commodities and things. Um, so in the East, there's less of a. You know, this is a bit of a, stereo, you know, bit of a, a stereotype, but there's less of a concern about personal goods than there is in the West. So they just get on with rebuilding. So they're quite happy to rebuild in wood or in the case, or bamboo. In the case of Manila, a lot of the housing in Manila, uh, it's cheap. It's what they can afford. You know, they can't afford fancy goods anyway, so they don't want, you know, it's something that they're not so worried about. But yeah, yeah, Venice, yeah, Venice and those cities, um, well, we're seeing at the moment the, the awful relationship between water, um, climate change, and, and, and urban planning. So, mm. Anyone else? Yeah, Tom. Just, just a quick point on Detroit, you mentioned it a couple of times. It seems to be that the regeneration of Detroit uh, is coming from an opposite angle to corporatism. Yeah. Grassroots, yeah. Grassroots, yeah. Groups, collective, city. So that's going to shift a whole notion of what Detroit would <coughs> be like in 50, 60, 70 years. Mm -hmm. from yeah, I think so. I think so. And you can see it in other cities as well. You can see it. You can see it in Rio. You can see it in Rio and Sao Paulo with their resistance towards the developers in the 60s and 70s and, and more recently. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't read the book yet, <laughs> <laughs> but. Why is the historical dimension to this such a valuable analytical tool as compared with studying, in the case of the motor car, the technology? Yeah. I mean, it might be, I'm sure it would be very interesting to know about how his cities have historically developed. But as opposed to a geographer mm. or an economist observing the life before, why does the historical concept or, or two becomes so important, do you think? And, and just, I mean, the observations that Jane Jacobs made mm. were drawn from the evidence before her eyes, weren't they? Yes, yes, yes. So, so, well, and, and the, well, so well, why would a historical, I mean, does, does the history underpin this in some way, the, the way cities have developed? Well, what is, I'm it, sure what is a city? A city is a product of, is a product of, of Changing tastes, changing fashions, changing right. styles, changing structures yeah, over sure. time. Sure, sure. What you know, Jacobs is is charting that, isn't she? When she's talking about the decline of the street, this is a historical process. Exactly. So that's a given. Why not take the the slices which exist, for example, in our own time? Does is it particularly helpful to know that all cities are hard? as in Roman times a forum, and streets as in Roman times? Well, I think so. Terribly? Yeah, yeah. Is I it? think, well, Max Weber wrote a book all about it, published he posthumously. Um, yes, the city, you can trace the city from its ancient times. Um, and that's, that's, that's how he saw a distinction between the Western city and the Oriental city, which is a problematic thesis that he, that he advanced. But, you know, it's, it's about taking la longue durée approach to studying yeah, the contemporary. This is what the urban history does. Urban historian does. Someone like Sam Bass Warner. You take the contemporary issue, 
or to contemporary city, and you drill back in time to trace it through. The city is a palimpsest, layered, built up over time. Tell me. I'm not convinced, but perhaps when I've read the book. That's fair enough. We'll talk about it then. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Place, yeah, is this, is it, the Westfield, is that, what's that with the Westfield yeah. shopping centre? Yeah. There's, there's nothing there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, what was the question? I didn't know. Well, it's, it's not about the impact of um, the centre of Bradford being more or less, you know, left as a whole for 10 years. Mm. Mm. Yeah, sure, and there's, and there's similar stories all across the city centre of Leeds, you know, where when the banks, when the, when the banking crisis you know, kicked off in 2008, the money dried up and Leeds at the time was, was pursuing some grand plan to create a skyscraper city. And that was temporarily curtailed because of lack of money, or, you know, the, the swimming pool, um, you know. So all they put up was Bridgewater Place, which was a, a great success, as we know. Um, but, um, yeah, 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 no, I, I, I would... Yeah, so cities can change an enormous amount in a short space of time. And they're influenced by, yes, big global economic issues, um, but they act upon that as you know, Bradford acts on that. Are you kind of suggesting that we shouldn't forget about that? Yeah. That history, because yeah, okay, sure. there's something there now, but the fact that there wasn't anything there for so long is important. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying with Park Street. Yeah. Let's not forget about it. Yes, I think we've got time for one more. Oh, Liz. Sorry, I was just continuing with Bradford again. Yeah. Uh, thinking about the, uh, the twin cities across uh, Europe and perhaps the global. Thing to the and really well. It's a shame, really, I think, that that couldn't have been 20 years. Actually, it's 20 brand new places. <laughs> 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 um, corridor where the city's coming, which leads into the war, to strengthen it. Uh, what do you think of that? I think that might happen. Isn't, isn't, isn't that called the Northern Powerhouse? Isn't, isn't this the it's idea? Um, <laughs> though we're all going to be twinned with Manchester. Um, I, think that's, I think that's the idea, to create some kind of urban corridor that's connected through, through the, rail, the railway network, and we're all very cynical about it, but we, we, we wait with bated breath to see if it works. But yes, it's a shame that Leeds and Bradford are not on closer terms. They never have been. You know, we think about, the, we think about this space and why it was put up it was a response to the development of St George's Hall in Bradford. And the fundamental difference between the two buildings is that the Bradford Hall was paid for by public subscription. This was paid for through taxpayers' money because they couldn't raise enough funds through subscription. So there's a fundamental difference, certainly in the mid-19th century, about civic pride. And I think that continues, certainly through to the post-World War II years, and I think some of the reasons why Bradford embraces the motor car, even more so than Leeds, is I think it's trying to do something distinctive um, in the 60s and the 70s. Um, for, if you're interested, a, a, a former colleague of Michael Simon Gunn, who works at Leicester University, is, is working on Bradford and work, looking at the relationship between the motor car, urban planning in the 60s and the 70s, and the changing social composition of the city with, you know, with the rise of... Of, a, of, a, of, of an immigrant population in the city. I can recommend that. I'm on Leeds and Bradford. <laughs> I'm Otley. <laughs> yeah. LS Postco. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I think we'll have to leave it now, but obviously Shane will be around for five minutes if anyone would like to talk to him one to one. And we'll see you in January at our next uh, talk, which is Dr. Heather Shaw talking about the real life Fagin and histories yeah. of Victorian criminal underworlds. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.